Finally, I want to go into the other direction uh, and uh, solve two possible problems. One of them was that, as you remember, GFP absolutely needs the presence of oxygen to mature. What about if you force to work on an obligate anaerobe? Also, how do we go to uh, yet higher spatial resolution? And there are tricks to do so with optical microscopy, but the fundamental way that most of our high resolution spatial information in cell biology has come about is through electron microscopy. And up to now, electron microscopy has lacked a genetically encodable tag that does what GFP does. In other words, where you can just put in a gene, fuse it to the protein that you care about, and then follow it around by your favorite form of microscopy. It would be great if we could do that in electron microscopy. And here the trick is again to go to another protein, another completely different protein family. This is Arabidopsis phototropin, which binds flavins, in particular flavin mononucleotide. And flavins are also ubiquitous in biochemistry. Essentially, all organisms that we care about have them, including the obligate anaerobes. And so uh, this protein, as it came out of the plant, doesn't do any fluorescence. It only uses light to trigger phototransduction. But again, by a somewhat similar trick, as with a somewhat analogous trick to the infrared fluorescent protein, we can frustrate the signal transduction, turn it into a fluorophore, and this fluorophore happens, by the way, to make something called singlet oxygen as a byproduct. It does it actually quite well, and these curves uh, uh, represent the data showing that the uh, fluorescence, which is rather like GFP in wavelengths, but admittedly not terribly bright. Uh, and plus, it's singlet oxygen. Singlet oxygen is normally a bad thing for us, and, and microscopists don't like it because it's responsible for a lot of the photobleaching. So we try to make as little singlet oxygen as possible. But when you have a protein that makes singlet oxygen well, you can use a special form of histochemistry that's been known for a long time. Uh, and singlet oxygen uh, will polymerize a molecule that we supply in dead fixed cells. So this, remember, electron microscopy is, has to be done, has always been generally done on dead fixed cells. So we don't mind after fixation supplying on diaminobenzidine. And this molecule is instantly polymerized very locally wherever the singlet oxygen is made. It's polymerized into a precipitate that then is stainable by osmium. And osmium is the counter stain that we use so much in electron microscopy anyway. So wherever this protein was fused, when we excited light with light in the presence of oxygen gas, and maybe I should explain here, oxygen gas that you and I are breathing is a very unusual s molecule in the sense that it's a triplet. It has unpaired electrons. And uh, when it encounters the excited state of this uh, singlet oxygen generating protein. Uh, the regular oxygen gets excited to this singlet oxygen state, which is an excited state of oxygen, still diffusible like regular oxygen, can cross membranes, but it is a ravening beast in its chemical re reactivity. And it loves to attack methionines, tryptophans, histidines, and so on, but also will attack diaminobenzene and make this polymer. So uh, here we've uh, transfected in Minisog and targeted it to mitochondria by fusing it to uh, a piece from cytochrome C, which of course is this well-known mitochondrial protein. And we can see those mitochondria by fluorescence here. And they look like regular mitochondria. These, in a live cell, they look sort of like you know, these little wispy threads. Uh, but then the crucial thing is that we can fix the cells and turn up the light, uh, bubble pure oxygen to help efficiency, and include diaminobenzidine. And wherever there was fluorescence before, we turn it into this black precipitate. And uh, that doesn't look too impressive yet. But that black precipitate can be looked at in the electron microscope at higher and higher magnification. So this is a blow up of one of those mitochondria down to the scale where you can see 200 nanometers and we can see all the Christi and the, the spaces between the inner and outer membrane. And this is the sort of classic appearance of a mitochondrion that you would have seen from a textbook. But this mitochondrion has been picked out genetically. And here's another test case. This is the gap junction that I mentioned. And uh, the 
we fuse connexin 43, one of the major constituents of gap junctions, to this so-called singlet oxygen generating protein, mini-SOG. And by the way, I forgot to say mini refers to the fact that this protein is only 106 amino acids. It's less than half the size of GFP. And there are times when it uh, is a, a better fusion partner just because it's small. And as I said, it doesn't need oxygen to fluoresce because it uses the flavins that the cells provide. Of course, when we want to make the precipitate, we have to provide oxygen, but that's done anyway after the cell is, uh, is dead and fixed. So uh, these are the gap junctional stripes. Uh, these are in, at ordinary fluorescence microscope level. These are the boundaries between individual cells that are lit up as gap junctions. This is after we have illuminated them in the presence of diaminobenzene and oxygen and converted them into black precipitates. And then when we blow it up, we can uh, blow it up to the scale where we can e actually see, we believe, individual uh, hexamers uh, as these white shadows in this what looks like a machine gun belt of, uh, of uh, precipitate. Uh, that's its sort of crude appearance. Uh, it looks like sort of bullets uh, periodically spaced. And uh, these white uh, blobs may be the leftover connexin that is blocking the formation of precipitate everywhere else. In other words, the uh, mini SOGs up here are spitting out precipitate and they go everywhere they can, but the protein where the connexin is sort of blocks it and it keeps, keeps it away because the space is already occupied. And then when the knife that makes the section cuts through this, if you happen to cut right through the center of this region, you can get the periodic array and uh, see things at very much higher resolution. Uh, by comparison, uh, old-fashioned technique, still I mean, useful in many cases, but more difficult, which is uh, immunogold uh, electron microscopy, uh, only light, uh, captures a very small fraction of the proteins because here we are trying to diffuse antibodies through a fixed tissue and the fixation tends to, to destroy a lot of the antigenic reactivity and the antibody has a hard time getting into the section and uh, also any excess has to be washed out. So we're lucky when we can at least see a few dots at the gap junction but a picture like this which is a good quality immuno EM doesn't give you any impression of how densely packed this crystalline array of connexins is and we know this from other you know many other experiments that the connexins look something like this uh, according to this model that I'm showing up here.